After the uh, Newtown tragedy, reports indicated that safety procedures, including security drills and limited access, were in place in the school. New Jersey also has had very strict school security requirements that include crisis plans, uh, agreements with local law enforcement, and security drills. Our first panel will address current state requirements as well as strategies that schools should consider, uh, strategies that perhaps might be considered best practices and uh, ought to be considered for implementation, as I said. Um, let me introduce our panel of experts. Ron Susswine. Ron, hold your hand up. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ron uh, is well known to many of us. He's an assistant attorney general in the New Jersey Division of Criminal Justice. Uh, as co-chairman of the attorney general's education and law enforcement working group, he played a key role in the development of the model, the model agreement that is, between schools and law enforcement agencies in the state of New Jersey. He is also the principal author of the New Jersey School Search Policy Manual. Anthony Bland. Anthony. Anthony is the state coordinator for the Department of Education's Office of School Preparedness and Emergency Planning. He is the, state, uh, the state's point person in ensuring that required security planning and procedures are addressed in public schools. Raymond Heiduka. Ray is the president of the New Jersey State Association of Chiefs of Police. Ray also serves um, as a police chief and emergency management coordinator in South Brunswick. Uh, he designed and implemented the South Brunswick School Resource Officer Program, and he wrote and implemented um, active shooter policies and emergency response procedures. Before we open the program to uh, questions, and we'll do that in, in just a little bit, uh, each panelist will provide five minutes of comments uh, regarding current school safety requirements and additional enhancements uh, that schools might <coughs> consider after Newtown. Uh, I would like to uh, begin with our representative from local law enforcement. So uh, Chief uh, Heiduka, if you would do us the honors and start us off. Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm going to focus on three things, coordination, communication, and training. These are things that we're doing in South Brunswick and things that other chiefs and their agencies are doing throughout the state. Currently, we're working to reassess the physical security inside the school, the perimeters, with target hardening, cameras, locks, and the security systems. In South Brunswick, I'm very proud to say we have specially trained officers that can actually conduct security surveys. We do them approximately every five years, and we were just in the process of updating them. We have a great relationship in South Brunswick with our school officials. We work hand in hand. Uh, we work with them on the active shooter response drills, lockdowns, bomb threats, fire drills, and non-evacuation drills. I know there's a big focus on the active shooter, but there are other things that can occur in the school that you have to be cognizant of. Now, by statute, schools are required to drill once per month. They're not required to have law enforcement involved, but I'm going to emphasize the school officials and law enforcement, you need to coordinate and work together. The following drills have to be done at least two times per year, the active shooter, evacuation, the bomb threat, and the lockdown. All these drills have to be done during school hours and during summer months. Now, in South Brunswick, we're always advised when they're going to occur, we always have a patrol response and a supervisor respond to these drills. Just so there's a, the culture that they see us there, these things become routine. I know there was discussion before about seeing the police officer. I could tell you in South Brunswick, they're very used to seeing police officers. So it's a culture. They're used to it. Um, our prosecutor in Middlesex County has a directive where we're required to do semi-annual in-service on active shooter response and biannual drilling to participate 
in an actual active shooter drill. We have a live drill at the school and we contact other emergency services. Uh, there's some active shooter priorities and this is our training and we emphasize this to our school officials. It may seem just like a law enforcement thing, but if there is an active shooter, all of my officers and many officers, I could speak uh, very confidently for Middlesex County, there's four priorities. You stop the active shooter, you rescue the victims, you provide medical assistance, and you preserve the crime scene. Now, it's uh, not something educated when we're talking to them. They're shocked that we have to actually tell them this, but they have to be aware because, unfortunately, that's what is occurring now. Uh, additional things that can be done and some things we are doing in South Brunswick. Uh, at one point, we did have a school resource officer for every school. That is when the cops and school grant came, the funding dried up, and the reality of the economy has hit. What we did, we had an innovative program, and I'll, my deputy chief, I'll give him credit, he put together a patrol practice where last year we had over 2,000 contacts in the school. Every patrol officer is required, and that includes the midnight shift, to stop and check at the school. If the school's open, they have to go in and check. That's over 2,000 contacts. If, that's, if that uh, school is in your area, in your district, you're required to go there. Visible presence, there's a constant visible presence, and we start that every, every year we remind people that that's what we'll be doing. Uh, something that some other chiefs have, you know, quite frankly thought that I was uh, going a little outside the box. I have police officers that live in town, their children go to school in town. I will give my officer, I will assign them to the school that day to go on the field trip. They have to notify the police department with wherever the field trip is. They are to carry their firearm. They are still a police officer, but they will go on the field trip. It's just an extra measure of security for our children. Uh, walking tours, we just implemented this. The schools are very big. Some are bigger, some are smaller, but they have to be familiar with the schools. Uh, we have overlapping shifts. The sergeant is required to take his squad to walk through the school one school a month, and they'll be repeating them. They need to be very familiar with the school. If there's an incident in the South Gym, I want my office to know exactly where the South Gym is. <clears throat> uh, an emphasis that uh, I've worked with some other school districts, they had a policy that only uh, the central office could call 911. I think that's a problem. We emphasize that anyone should be allowed to call the police in the school. Uh, incident command training, that's usually done with just law enforcement. Uh, we emphasize to the school officials, they're in charge of their school, even during a crisis, when it becomes a law enforcement <coughs> issue, we'll take it over, but you have to be in charge. Constant communication with parents and school on safety issues. We, if you don't have Nixle, you need to get involved with it. We have over 10,000 people registered. When we have a stranger alert or a luring incident, we notify our parents. We notify everyone in the community. We do it through sending uh, letters home in the packets. It's constant communication. If you take anything out of this, law enforcement must meet frequently with school officials and discuss issues regarding security and safety. I meet with my superintendent frequently. I could tell you I talk to him every week. I speak with him on the weekends. When an issue comes up, I said, Dr. McCartney, we had a luring incident. He activates his communications and the parents are advised. Uh, I'll wrap this up. I'm getting a lot of questions about law enforcement versus armed security in school. Now, as a police chief, I want authority and control over any person in a school that's armed. Uh, police officers, they're required to have extensive background checks and training, and the schools can get them by having an SRO program or hiring them off duty. Now, numerous calls, what about hiring armed security, retired officers, and some people I know are not going to like it, but you could quote me on it. I am not in favor of this plan at all. They have no law enforcement powers to arrest. They don't have up-to-date up training on use of force and active shooter tactics unless the security company is really up on it and we have no way to check on it. They're not privy to our police procedures that the district are working in. They cannot communicate with responding law enforcement officers. They cannot detain or frisk subjects. They have no more police power than any citizen and that would include a retired officer. Uh, I'm just, my feeling is armed security is going to provide a full sense of security 
and there could be severe consequences on the school administration if security personnel acts reckless with a firearm. Now, if you can't have a police officer in the school, I understand there's funding issues. I would recommend focus your attention on prevention through sound procedures, policy, and enhance your security measures and work with your law enforcement officials to have a more visible presence. Uh, in closing, law enforcement and school officials must develop a partnership with and communicate with each other. The time to prevent a problem is before it becomes a problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. Ron? Thank you. I just want to make a few uh, uh, general <coughs> observations. The first is an obvious one. The last thing you came to hear today was a lawyer uh, to talk to you. We understand that lawyers fly lazy circles over every aspect of the human endeavor. Um, we have had defensive medicine for years, and regrettably, we've come to the point of having defensive education. So we have to recognize. By the way, we lawyers love to use jargon and terminology. That way we can pretend that we know what we're talking about and you won't know that we don't know what we're talking about. We use Latin. Uh, for example, in the, uh, the school context in dealing with uh, juvenile law, there's this phrase, in loco parentis, right? This notion that we as the government and you as educators are standing literally in the stead, in the place of parents, the parents' patria doctrine. I just want to run a Latin phrase by you and to get your reaction. I want to do this right. Do this right. Protego maxima fiento duri. Does anyone recognize that? That's from Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. <laughs> that was the spell that the teachers at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and, and uh, Wizardry used to erect that impressive shield that came down around, around Hogwarts to protect the students from Voldemort and the Death Eaters. And it didn't work then, and it won't work now. There is no magic wand, there is no spell or incantation that you can do to make your schools safe. But you will be under enormous pressure. The proof is that you are here today in such enormous numbers and this incredibly impressive turnout. You're expected to do something and you want to know what that is and what you're expected to do. I ask you, and following up on the Chief's remarks, please resist the temptation to do something that is decisive and visible but that you know in your heart and in your intellect is unavailing and the wrong thing to do although you will be pressured to do it. Dr. Elias was talking about the climate and the climate of fear, and yet, inescapably, we use frightening terms. We're using them today. Let me tell you something. The word lockdown, when you went to school to become an educator, it might even have been here at this wonderful uh, college that I'm uh, on the adjunct faculty for, um, you didn't learn the word lockdown. That wasn't part of learning how to be an educator. That's a correctional term. That's a term that was developed for use in prisons. Another term that we throw out, because we have to, we have to be candid about this, target hardening. That's a military term, and it evokes the image of a smart bomb traveling down to a bunker, and is the bunker strong enough to survive that? We present, uh, in, in the Bergen County prosecutor is in the process of developing an, an excellent uh, video uh, training vignette on school security, an active shooter thing. I'm watching this the other day. Now I'm a grizzled prosecutor, 31 years as a prosecutor. I'm watching this and the tears are rolling down my cheeks and I'm going, oh my God. And this was the one that was designed for educators to watch, not the law enforcement one. So these are some of the things. Here's the good news. Look around you. You're not alone. And a lot has been done. There is a lot of resources out there. The one thing I want to caution you, if I have a theme, is that we can't just be talking about the active shooter scenario. The, as Dr. Elias pointed out in terms of the, of the climate, there are so many other sources of fear that erode and undermine the quality of the educational environment, so many of which involve the law enforcement activity but not the active shooter. 
either yesterday or the day before, a seven-year-old in far Rockaway, Queens, brings a gun, a loaded gun, into school. That happens. Uh, in fact, I, I would suspect that show and tell is, is probably a more <coughs> common reason for guns coming into the school than a ninja-clad assassin coming in to shoot up the school. And there are tools for that. I just want to mention one because it's been around so long you probably don't know about it. The school search policy manual, which was designed to help to educate uh, school officials on what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do in terms of using techniques to search lockers and, and, uh, and book bags and to keep guns and knives out of school. Because the natural instinct would be, well, aren't I better off with the lawyers flying lazy circles over every day? Aren't I better off doing nothing? Because if I do something, I can be sued. That's called a commission. You commit an act, and if the act is unreasonable, you can be sued for that. Let me tell you something, guys. The lawyers will get you coming or going. The failure to act, that's what we call in the law an omission, can subject you and your department to liability. So you might as well do the right thing. And we have a responsibility to tell you what that is. Because with respect to that authority, the exercise of that authority, to keep weapons, I'm not talking about the ninja-clad uh, person coming in. I'm talking about the guns and knives and drugs and other things that can end up in school. What message are you sending if you do nothing? Is that the message of looking the other way or enabling? By the same token, when you do act, you've got to act lawfully. Because what message, what lesson would you be sending? How can you expect the students to follow the rules if you don't follow the rules and you don't know what they are? Now, New Jersey is well positioned to deal with this. We've had remarkable cooperation between education and law enforcement longer than anyone. And it started with the, uh, the, the drug initiative in the mid-1980s. And I was there when that happened. That's what led to the memorandum of agreement. And it started with drugs and it's since been expanded to, uh, to, to weapons and firearms and sexual assaults and bullying most recently and, and other areas of mutual concern. And I remember when we started at the time, the myths that, that separated our two professional communities, law enforcement and education. Because law enforcement officers would think, oh, educators, those are the touchy-feely, spare-the-rod types. And we assumed that educators thought of us as the guerrillas, you know, the SWAT team uh, uh, going in and everything is a matter of just arresting people and locking them up. And when we first met, and this was after the crack epidemic in, in the New York metropolitan area, there was role reversal. We had school officials grabbing police chiefs on this committee by the lapel saying, help us, get the drugs out of the school, as if we were the sole answer to that. And I had to explain the limits. But what came of that, that was all part, and I think it has relevance today, when the Attorney General at the time issued a statewide narcotics action plan that made narcotics enforcement the top priority and made protecting schools. That's when the drug-free school zone law had come in and that was the emphasis at the time. And there was one of the directives, I'll never forget this, it was Directive, uh, uh, directive 5.10 in the statewide narcotics action plan. I called it, because I'm a Star Trek fan, I called it the Prime Directive because it was the non-interference policy. And what it said to law enforcement, in our zeal to protect schools and school children from, at the time, the scourge of illicit drugs, we cannot violate the sanctity of the educational environment that we are actually hoping to protect. Now, in terms of some, we're, we're right now, we're all looking. There are no quick fixes. And the key thing is sustainability. Benjamin Franklin had this great line, which I'm going to butcher now. Uh, he said it better than I'm going to say it. He said that laws, referring to laws, laws that are too lenient are seldom obeyed, too severe, seldom enforced. The same is true of policies. If you come up with a knee-jerk reaction policy that makes you feel good for the next couple weeks, in a couple weeks you're going to start to not enforce it and you're right back to where you started with, which is complacency. Not that, not that we started with complacency here, because we have been, been leading it. As you know, um, uh, yesterday the governor announced a safe, uh, uh, what's called the safe task force, which will be looking at violence more generally, a major part of that is the school violence. And I will be helping to staff that. So I came here today to learn things and to, and to take things back, um, to back for that. If there's anything besides the questions that we're going to be hit with,
that I, the Division of Criminal Justice, the Attorney General's Office can do to help you on being able to be confident in some of the activities. That's, the, that's what the school search manual is designed to do, is to, to tell you what you're allowed to do so you can do it with confidence. Uh, please let me know today or at any other time. So thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Ron. Anthony? Uh, I'd like to say good morning to everyone. I, I do want to take at least 10 seconds to extend my condolences to all those that were affected by the tragedy uh, that took place this uh, past December in Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut. Uh, I think we are really beginning to see how we are shifting and how we're thinking as a society. Uh, it's been quoted by many, including President Barack Obama, and, and I will say it like this, no single law can eliminate evil from the world or prevent senseless acts. And so all of my fellow panelists have said that. We must respond, we must do something. And Dr. Elias said earlier, and he quoted two of my favorite people, but one is John Wooden. And John Wooden is one of the most winningest coaches in basketball history, but he used to have a quote that says this, be quick and be fast, but don't be in a rush because you become haste. And that's what I think the fellow two panelists have said, Ron, uh, and Ray is that don't just be knee jerk, be concise about what you want to do uh, and be consistent. And I think if it's accurate about the statement I just made, then if you don't have a plan, then you plan to fail. It's that simple. You must understand that it's not just about armed guards, it's not just about metal detectors, it's about people knowing their roles, responsibilities, having a response, and having a sense of culture, a school that is safe, and appropriately making sure that all students, no matter regardless of zip code, that they feel warm and welcome in that environment. And we must understand that as we're creating these particular environments, it's about academic success as well, and about developing self-sufficient students. And in research has shown, and I'm sure Dr. Elias can attest to this, when students are fearful, academic excellence does not matriculate the way we want it to. All of which is, leads us to say that the New Jersey School Boards Association has us all here, and you guys can't see what I see. And I see a sea of faces of confident people. I also see a sea of faces of people saying, I hope someone on that panel tells me something I can do really quick to get people to get off my back. <laughs> but I can't do that. I also think we need to understand that we have what's called the Governor's School Security Task Force. I know people are saying, wow, the state is going to have another task force. Uh, but I think it's about looking at the focus of what we're doing. Our task force that I serve on and my staff, it was based on Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania. And basically, we begin to say, oh my goodness, Columbine, what's going on? And then we had the Amish school shooting, and people continually say, I never thought it can happen here. I really hope, and a part of my remark said, that small bubble that exists in the nation that says, I never thought it can happen here, I don't know what more we can do. I really don't. Because it's amazing as we go through the nation, one person brings a bomb in his shoe, and what happens when we fly? We all take our shoes off. So now that 20 students were shot, murdered, assassinated, whatever you want to say, I think we have to really look at it in a different way. It's not just about public safety. It is a public safety crisis issue, and we have to combine those particular items. Looking at mental health, looking at public health, looking at policies and procedures that are appropriate. And I think I will make another quote, and I think this is so important. Everyone is like, well, what do we do? We're just practicing. You play as you practice. If you practice poorly, you perform poorly. If we teach poorly, our students cannot understand academic rigor. And that's why we need to understand what we're doing. I will get into just some, I call them finite details because that's what I have to do. Uh, as of October 15th of 2012, uh, all schools in the state of New Jersey were required uh, to have a, to update their school safety and security plan. Commissioner Cerf, uh, which I commend him for, was one of the most aggressive commissioners of education in the nation where he laid out a 91 point plan that identified those items that should be in all school safety and security plans. There's no guessing. There are items and you need to know these are minimums. They came out in August. We gave our school districts over a year to meet with stakeholders, to collaborate with chiefs, uh, to collaborate with parents, their school environments. And some of those items, and they're just to give you aesthetics so you can see, is to make sure every school district has a district-wide planning team, that you're collaborating and looking at diverse partners. You have building-based teams. 
to make sure when we look at that schools, we understand you have a master schedule. What does your schedule look like? And you might say, Anthony, why do you want to know my master schedule? Because if we are really responding to school, we want to know where people are. Are we in block schedule? Isn't it 48 minutes? What does it look like in your school? We also, I think we're aggressive and you look, we begin to talk about mental health services that are our schools really prepared to provide services that if our students are going through traumatic events and then I'll talk about those two items lastly is that every school is supposed to have a classroom guide what can we know rapidly to make our schools respond to emergencies and all schools are supposed to also uh, have what was called a school administrator toolkit so as we go back to our schools you need to go back and say are we doing these things do we have these things and I'll be I'll be fair and assess that I think many people say Anthony we're good we know what we're doing leave us alone but that's not my job. My job is to care for all students, whether we're in Sussex County, all the way down to, Cam uh, to Salem County, and make sure it's applicable. Uh, we talked about the school security drill law. I won't mention it. Everything was accurate that we heard, so there's no issue to reiterate. I'll just touch on two points. Just because you practice an active shooter lockdown drill does not mean that you know how to do a lockdown drill. And it's also important to know every time you're locking down your school, it does not mean that there's a shooter. It could be many, many incidents and crises where you use that particular response, such as in Monmouth County, they had a deer break into a school, right? And everybody goes, it's a deer. I don't know if you've ever seen what a deer does to a car, but can you imagine a deer in an elementary school? That school was very responsive. They did a fabulous job, and I thought that was an appropriate response. Also, about law enforcement, I think it's important to know that the guidelines call for all schools to give a 48-hour notice to their local law enforcement. So before you do a drill, you need to notify law enforcement for a couple reasons. One is so they're not deploying resources to the wrong area. Two is that so they can come and observe your drills and find out what's taking place. And the third one, we have all educators in the room. If it is 70 degrees tomorrow, even though we don't have school, will we not have a fire drill? Right? And we laugh and chuckle and everybody goes, ooh, Anthony got us. Because Murphy's Law says crises and emergencies don't happen when we want. But we really practice like they will. Like we don't practice when we're changing classes. We don't do things when we think uh, students are coming on and off the buses. And those are things that we have to think about. <clears throat> Just in general, I do think there's some resources out there. Uh, if people need to find out what's taking place, you can visit the Office of School Preparedness's website. In addition, you can look at the Governor's School Safety and Security website about safer schools for a better tomorrow. Uh, at this time, I do want to make an aggressive statement and really have people confident. I'm not going to guarantee that we can eliminate anything. But what I can say is we will do our best to ensure the safety and we're following our rules and regulations. And with that, we will be aggressive. We will make sure we are conscientious. We will be conscientious of instructional time, too, because I sit, as I sit here, I know people are saying, well, Anthony, we made our school safe, and if our language arts literacy scores go down, we'll be in the paper and no one will care. And also, you need to know that we want you to plan for the future. So as we're preparing our schools, we have been aggressive to tell them, look, emergencies can happen anytime, any place, and anywhere, and be prepared for that. And our staff at the department, along working with all of our uh, supporters in the AG's office, looking at uh, chiefs of police, Office of Homeland Security, law enforcement, OEM, is looking at these things. We want to protect our schools from all emergencies, whether it's a pandemic to Hurricane Irene or Sandy, to an active shooter, or if it is gang issues or gang violence. In closing, I will say this, saving lives means having the plan and the training uh, to do that for your school community. And then I think this quote is appropriate. You don't go to a dance to learn how to dance. As such, that applies to crisis season responding to them. Thank you. Questions, questions for uh, the panelists? Again, I would ask that you state your name and affiliation. Laura. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Feinstein. Laura Lab, West Orange Board of Education. I, I guess I have a question for, I understand there's some of our elected officials in the audience today, and for the two gentlemen from the Department of Education, um, we're limited to a 2% cap. As the school boards prepare our budget goals, and I listen to the options of enhancing security, certainly some things do not come with the price tag that we can implement but many things do come with a price tag. 
Is there any consideration for the governor to give us an exemption to that 2% cap to reinstate the counselors that we had to lay off in 2009 or the, the S, uh, substance abuse counselors, the social workers, purchase the mirrors, the metal detectors? Um, has there been any discussion to give us those tools that the governor has in his toolkit to help us? <laughs> You may not like the beginning of what I said. Okay. I cannot deny or affirm uh, that there will be, everyone's laughing, <laughs> that there will be any dramatic changes. Uh, what I will say that's appropriate is in our budgets, there are areas uh, that you can error mark for school safety and security. I will also say, this is not about having a knee-jerk reaction. It's about looking at your budget, looking at your community, and planning it out as you're going forward uh, with your, you'll be making your school budget presentations. And looking to say, what do we want to do to change the environment and the culture of our schools? So if your school community believes that it's security guards, if they believe it's metal detectors, if they believe it's those particular items, then you have to have the local, you can make the local decision to employ those in your district. Uh, the only issue with that is, you have to make sure they're not, they are not reactionary. I didn't really like that, but okay. I know. Thank you. Okay, let's, uh, let's go over to microphone number two. Frank Healing from Edison Township School Board. And uh, I think the big concern I have is that people give lip service to it, but I don't see much being done with mental health. Just about all of these people are somewhat uh, have deep-seated problems mentally, and we don't have the institutions, and as a society, we're not really providing to put them away. I think of uh, Charles Krauthammer, who's a psychiatrist, when they uh, asked him about this, and he said, well, uh, when I worked at the Massachusetts General Hospital, if I uh, diagnosed a person as really being in need of an institution, uh, he was taken away and it was done. Now, of course, there's all sorts of protections for people. Uh, oh, they have their rights, they have this, they have that. They, you cannot uh, put them away. So I think this, we have to look at some of the laws that we have and also the funding for institutions. As you know, what's happened in California due to budget cuts uh, and let the, everybody out of the jails uh, regardless of what has happened. And, and uh, so, I mean, there's the, the, of course, the uh, immigration problem, undocumented aliens. Uh, all of this, as well as the larger culture, what was num number one in, in terms of movies just about a week ago, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, how to do it. What are our children reading in the school? Sometimes, uh, I forbid be any, uh, taking it off the list, Hunger Games, where children kill children. Uh, you go into uh, a Target st a store and you see Xbox, and I saw nothing but horrible, violent, grotesque creatures killing each other, and, and so I think we have to look at also that the broader context of society, the, the violence uh, that I might even say, uh, that we wreak upon uh, unborn children in antiseptic laboratories uh, every day. So I think it's a much broader concept. I think the schools have done a terrific job and are doing a, a terrific job, and everything had been done in, in, in Newtown, so I think we should look at those broader issues of Hollywood movies, of some of the books that uh, we have in our society, or at least uh, uh, what we call alternate universes that we must uh, uh, let the children use their imagination, but all seem to be geared towards violence. So I think, and, and really, that important issue of mental health, what are we really doing about those who are not put together too well? Thank you. Please. I think the only thing, I, obviously that's not a law enforcement, I have no expertise in that. I do know that in the task force that was created yesterday by the governor, mental health issue is a major part of that. The governor has expressed concern over the um, violent video games and the movies. So although I personally have no expertise in that, I do know that is going to be something that we have 60 days to report to the governor as part of what he calls this, this ongoing conversation. So, and, I, and just to answer or respond to the first question, that was there, if these issues, some of them could be um, uh, that funding issue, the cap law issue, those also can be addressed to this task force. If you send me information, there is representative of education on that task force. 
but also as just a, a staff person, those are the types of things that we're supposed to be looking at. I also might, might add, uh, Dr. Elias uh, told us some very um, um, interesting and poignant facts about what school districts can do in terms of uh, assessments dealing with character education, emotional health, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's not a direct answer, but it's certainly linked uh, to the whole uh, mental health issue. Um, so, uh, Anthony, do you have something? No, I just wanted to say one thing real quick. Uh, the tr we have to begin to also use the resources we have in our community. Uh, I know hopefully people are familiar with the Traumatic Loss Coalition. That's a partner that we, we are recommending that our schools consistently use. They come out to schools. They are professionals that work in schools. They also have the background to be successful to help begin to modify and revise any sort of protocols you have in place for mental health services or responding to traumatic events or creating them. In addition, uh, last year I think was important, the Department of Education uh, provided three regional workshops on mental health services. Our resources are online about what our students can do in the classroom. If you go to the Office of School Preparedness's website, you can find those tools, hopefully, that you can use in your school locally and hopefully directly in the classroom. Uh, do we have any questions from the balcony? We do not want to forget, and we do have a taker. Please. Michael McGovern from Rockaway Township. I know that uh, law enforcement is strong in, the av in advocating uh, plain language in the use of our, um, of our code procedures. Boards of Education are very concerned about the language that goes out for those drills. Uh, what is the panel's, um, what is your uh, opinion on that? The use of plain language versus, uh, I know some districts use codes, others use the word lockdown, um, and law enforcement would like to see active shooter, bomb threat. What is, what is your opinion on that, on that such topic? It's very simple, and it's in our policies. We emphasize plain language. We've taken it a step further. We don't have codes anymore in our police department. So even our officers, are, the culture is now, there's no you know, calling out a code for a motor vehicle stop. You just say, I have a motor vehicle stop. And in our training with the school officials, we emphasize to say the same exact thing. Lock the door, open the door, there's the guy with the gun. Speak plain and simple. And from the department's stance, we also agree it's plain language, and it's important. Our staff and students respond well. And sometimes we think our students are not as tough as they are, but our students respond and they are very tough. What happens is we as adults become very nervous for them. Uh, we have gone to many schools where they go into lockdown, uh, about five, ten minutes later, they go back to math and they go back to instruction. When you begin to have codes, it, it changes. If we came over this loudspeaker right now and said code 300, who would know what to do? We wouldn't. We go to one school, we observe plans, and their code says Trojan horses are coming upon us. That doesn't help us understand how to respond, what the emergency is. Now, I will say this, how you end your emergency response, that's something you might consider to have a code because if you're looking at someone entering your school trying to manipulate you or an administrator, that's the context that you should take. But plain language, our schools will response, and I'll give you one last scenario. If we go to Newark International Airport, Newark or Philadelphia International Airport, they will really not care what my 10-year-old son hears over the loudspeaker. They are just going to respond and do the best they can to ensure the lives and the safety of all of us. If, if I can just add, if, if, a, if a, um, a code is meant to be a euphemism, they'll figure it out. <laughs> you know, if, if code three means lockdown and you drill, they'll figure it out. So I think you've got to give them more credit, but what you do not want is confusion. That's right. You don't want anyone not knowing what is going. And if you need codes during an operation because you think your communications are being intercepted by a bad guy, that's a different scenario but we got to give people credit and if you're going to have a lockdown drill and it started by saying code gray the next time you use the word code gray people are going to associate that anyway so you might as well call it what it is let's go to uh, microphone number one please uh, thank you uh, gary passanato i'm the mayor of the borough of somerdale in camden county i uh, just wanted to uh, answer one of the other earlier questions Earlier this week, uh, our District 6 legislature uh, held a meeting with mayors and superintendents from our district. And uh, we talked about this entire situation. 
One encouraging point was that uh, Senator Beach from the 6th District has crafted, is in the process of crafting a bill. It is with OLS right now. I did see it. I don't have a bill number yet, uh, which allows for an exemption outside the cap for any uh, expenses associated with increases to security measures in the school system. So uh, that is in the works right now, so hopefully it will get traction and will be on the governor's <laughs> desk soon. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, microphone number two, please. Steve Goldberg, uh, Principal A. Harry Moore, New Jersey City University. Uh, when I think about what I want law enforcement to do or help me as a principal is number one, help me identify the shooters. Number two, keep them out of my school. Uh, we have Megan's Law, which informs me of those people who committed a crime regarding sexual abuse. Why not have inform schools of those people who committed crimes using firearms so we know who those people are and if you are convicted of a crime with a firearm you surrender your right to ever enter a school again it seems like something that makes sense and even in terms of character development wouldn't it be useful information for schools to have those kids who are in homes where uh, someone was arrested for the use of a, a, a firearm. I mean, shouldn't those children deserve the extra help or extra empathy, if you will? So those are some of the things that I ask the uh, state uh, to help me in keeping my school safe. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go to the uh, balcony, please. Hi, Jim Myman from Ramsey Board of Education. My question goes uh, directly to Chief Haduka uh, concerning uh, school resource officers. Uh, since last spring, our district has been researching um, adding this to the staff. And recently, in a meeting with a representative from the New Jersey Association of School Resource Officers, uh, we had a, a debate around the committee table of sworn officer versus retired officer. And uh, I have to say, uh, we saw more benefits researching uh, going forward with the proposal of uh, retired officer, uh, A, uh, slightly lower cost, B, more uh, experience, uh, C, more uh, latitude inside the building, uh, such as searches, access to student records, uh, while still having potentially a, a, a voice that's familiar to local law enforcement. And, and also, finally, the uh, advantage of not being called a wet um, should uh, something severe happen within uh, the, lo the local town, the uh, chief could play. So my question is, is, is there something I'm missing? Is there something our committee is missing as we um, tend to look at the retired officer as a preferred option? Um, I, think you, I think they're missing a lot. First of all, an SRO program is based on a triad concept. A school resource officer isn't just there for security. It's based on law enforcement. He's a counselor. He's a teacher. He's there to develop relationships. He's also there as part of his law enforcement duties to focus on security issues, such as locking doors, better mechanisms. You would need a whole cadre of officers to make it this fortress type of issue, whether they're armed or police officers. For example, in South Brunswick, just the size of the school, there are times when somebody calls for a police response, just an ambulance even. My district car sometimes could beat the officer to the call as the first responder, just due to the size of the school. Um, with the armed officer, uh, uh, the retired officers, they've lost all their power. Uh, I don't know how, you know, what you research, but how can you, how can you say that the retired officers have more training and experience? True, they were officers for a long time, and I'm sure many of them do have a great deal of experience. But I know my officers have certain mandates. Twice a year they go to the range. 
They have uh, active shooter training. I mandate that they have to go to and the county prosecutor mandates it. Any contemporary issue that comes up, we train them. Uh, I, un I know the cost is going to be more for a police officer. And in reality, you're never going to have enough police officers to fully secure a school. And I don't think you'll have enough to, for even armed security. I like the idea of the police officers in the school. I do not like the idea of the um, armed officer because I don't have control over them. I've said it. It may sound like a control issue, and quite frankly, it is. I want to know who has a gun in that school, and I want authority over them, and I want to be able to direct them. That way they could communicate with my officers. I can't give private uh, security firm my radio. I just can't do it. I can't access them, my policies, which there's sensitive information in there that we can't release to the public. So, I mean, everyone has their opinion, but I feel strongly about it. The way to go is to have the police officer in the school and as an SRO model so he can interact, develop a culture, get that information from students, of any potential issues, and I don't mean make them informants, if there's a problem, those kids will tell you. They'll they tell my SROs and uh, work on target hardening. Use your technology in order to save your uh, manpower cost. Okay, thank you, Chief. Let's go to microphone number one. Thank you. My name is Elliot Stroll. I'm with the Jamesburg Board of Education. I'm a community liaison chairperson. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for having this seminar. It is awesome. The information you're, you're sharing with us is just great. I love it. Second, you, some people on the panel mentioned the word knee-jerk. This is a word that I hate. I hate knee-jerk reaction. Okay? I base all my decisions, and this is something I learned from my father, on three basic premises. Number one, am I physically capable of doing something? Number two, am I financially capable of doing something. And number three, which is actually number one, does it make common sense? Okay? It's got to make sense. And that is, is a widespread thing. The gentleman earlier was talking about movies and, and, and exposure. When we were kids, we grew up playing cowboys and Indians, playing war. We went to war movies. We went to cowboy movies, westerns. Okay? And the majority of people never had a problem, never had an issue. Okay? Um, I have never had the desire to pick up an automatic weapon or a Winchester repeating rifle and go out and start shooting people. Um, I believe that we have to operate on the premise of the Constitution that I may not agree with what you say, with what you write, with what you put on, put on TV or film, but I will fight to my death your right to say it, to film it, to put it on TV. That is on our, in our Constitution. And uh, I just hope that everybody thinks about common sense before they go and do anything crazy. Security is not a simple one-layer answer. It is multiple layers. To provide adequate security, you have to have layers. Think about that. Thank you. One thing that uh, uh, I would ask is uh, we have another fantastic panel. So uh, do me a favor and try to be just a little bit briefer with your questions. And let's go to microphone number two. Yes, thank you. I'm Eva Naj from Franklin Township in Somerset, a board member for 20 plus years. And the reason I add that because I have seen the changes and the demands on our school system and I want to bring us back to the funding issue. This year and the past two years, we have many new initiatives. Evaluation of teachers have changed that is costing us money. We have to retrofit all of our schools because ass assessments now are going to be online. So we have, and these are buildings that were built in the 1900s. We have HIV on us, that is costing us more. We need to put in more security cameras, something with our doors because our offices are recessed in. There are a number of things that are put back on us as school districts. We as an earlier speaker said about counselors we had to fire. We want to deal with the whole child. Student achievement is, is important. And yet with a 2% cap, and I, I really feel very strongly that we can't neglect looking at that. We can't continue doing everything. And it's getting to the point if we convert them, that responsibility will be given to us as well. Because so much is put on the schools more and more, and we welcome that, but we need the funding to go with that. 
And it's very important, and if we don't have the funding, and we have been prioritizing our budgets, but it comes to a point, there's not, nothing more to prioritize because so much is on top priority. And we don't have the funds to fund all of our priorities, yet we are expected and demanded to perform and face those priorities. Thank you, Thank you Ava. Uh, balcony, please. Good morning. Uh, my name is Chuck Carter. I'm the Director of Facilities and Security for the Linwood Board of Education in Atlantic County, the Mainland Regional High School, and I'm a representative of the New Jersey Building and Grounds Association. My question, and it's actually a question, is <laughs> as, early, as early as this morning, at 7 o'clock this morning, we had to shut down a high school of 1,600 students because of a social media complaint that came through of a possible threat of violence that was going to happen at the school. School officials and, and board members are put in a position of, of erring on the side of caution in a situation like this, and it gives the children the opportunity to basically bully an administration or bully a school district through social media. Has there been any guidance that we can look toward for ways of making decisions on this? in regard to the school safety and preparedness plans? I'll, I'll answer that uh, in this context. Uh, I did get the email this morning that a, a threat came into a school and the school decided to shut down uh, because they, a part of it is, are you shutting it down because of, you have to assess, is it credible evidence? Right? Are you making your decision in consultation with local law enforcement? Right? And those two things have to happen. Now, in addition to that, both institutions might still feel they don't want to get caught out there, they don't want to get in trouble, but every time there's a bomb threat, the school end, we go around throughout the nation where there are bomb threats and bomb threats. You have to begin to assess if it's credible. You must begin to make sure you're making joint decisions with local law enforcement uh, and those first responders. And the other thing is, see if you can write and change certain bylaws. So for example, there's a school uh, in the north where they received, I think it was anywhere between 10 and 16 bomb threats in one week. Uh, if you can imagine that at 30 minutes or 10 minutes a day, you've lost two, three hours of instruction. What they've done is they've, they've come into a process and a plan where they can extend the school day or they can change things. So that began to limit uh, all the bomb threats they were saying because when the students, I'm just using this as an example, when the students began to know that school wasn't going to end, uh, it decreased. So you have to make strategic decisions and you have to make sure that your threats are credible and you're not just being reactionary. Okay, uh, we have time for uh, one more uh, question. And remember what I said, uh, school security at njsba.org. All questions will be answered. Also, all the panel members, uh, including Dr. Elias, will be here immediately after the conclusion of the forum if you wish to ask questions. But uh, yes, the last question for this panel, please. Thank you. Mary Ann Dialessi, I'm here as a board of ed member of Kinalon Public School. A little bit louder, please. <coughs> Can you hear me better? Yes. Okay. Um, this may not be a question, but it's certainly something that needs to be addressed by the Governor's Task Force, directed to you, Ron. My concern is regarding the talk about mental health. I am also in the healthcare industry, and currently under the Affordable uh, Care Act, hospitals and physicians that are on electronic health records have are becoming members of health information exchanges. And what I learned the other day is um, a bit disturbing to me in the fact that information that is put into the, these exchanges are not going to include anyone up to the age of 18. So my deep concern is here is an avenue for everyone in this uh, building, all the schools and, and all the representatives of our administrators in the school districts in this state to learn the information of children that have been treated that are troubled up to the age of 18, and yet that information will not be shared. So the deep concern is the talk about mental health, and there is, right now there is no avenue under HIPAA laws that that information can be disclosed. So it's a big concern. It's a, I, I, I know that is a very important and complex issue, the interrelationship between HIPAA, the entire question of 
the, uh, the privilege information and whether that can actually have uh, the unwitting effect of chilling people from seeking help or being candid with therapists. So I know that that is going to be a major, well, I may not personally be able to contribute much to that, but I, I know that the task force is going to be looking at that quite uh, in the weeds. And I appreciate, and I wrote it down, and I will Great. communicate that back. And I can give my information. I'd love to be part of the task force. Uh, if you send me anything, because my job is, among other things, to canvas all the literature on violence that is out there, and so anything anyone has that you would want to go to the governor's task force, you can send it to me, and I'll make certain it gets to the members of the task force. And as Ron said before, uh, he has a significant role um, on that task force. So uh, he indicated he jotted down what you had to say. And knowing him as I do, the task force will hear it. Thank you so much. What a great job.